good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. This was not part of the program. <laughs> it was like, like an encore before the concert. <laughs> to indicate there will be no encore after the concert. <laughs> um, welcome to Wigmore Hall. Delighted to have you here and to see this wonderful hall filled to capacity again. And we welcome all our friends around the world, music lovers who are watching the streaming. We have to thank you, dear viewers, for your continued support of Wigmore Hall with your donations. And please continue to support this wonderful organization because it's much needed. So here we are tonight talking, I mean, I will be talking, you will be listening. <laughs> but the subject of this evening, as you know, is Schubert's very last piano sonata in B-flat major, Deutsch Verzeichnis 960, from the year 1828, September 1828, just a few months or weeks before he died. Uh, Schubert wrote his last three sonatas as a triptych, deliberately. They belong together, like before this Beethoven's last three sonatas, Opus 100 and 910 and 111 belong together. Before that, Mozart's last three symphonies were another triptych. And so the number three, uh, may I sit down? Yes, thank you. Uh, easy. Uh, so the number three is very important in, in all cultures, but especially so in our Western culture. When I speak of the Mozart symphonies, one has to think of the magic flute and the uh, Masonic f symbols. The, the number three means a lot there. I mean, there are three ladies and three boys, and it's based on this chord, the E flat triad, yes. Yeah. And so there is a saying or a proverb in German, alle guten Dinge sind drei. All good things are three. They come in three. There are some good things which, which come in fours, <laughs> <laughs> like the four seasons or the four temperaments. But three is, is quite important in, in theology, in religious terms, when we think of the Holy Trinity, or we think of uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, uh, you know, uh, faith, hope, and love, yes, three. Uh, we think in terms of the visual arts of all the wonderful triptychs that the Italian and the Flemish and the Dutch painters have given us, uh, all in threes. And also in, in folklore, in folk tales, you know, there are always the, uh, there are three daughters and three sons and so on. Three is a beloved number. And so with Schubert, I would like to talk a little bit now about character, that also the last three Mozart symphonies are, uh, two are in major key and one in minor. The, you know, that's one and then, So then, one minor, and then the Jupiter. So, very different tonalities and very different characters. Uh, Beethoven's last three sonatas. Uh, 
Yes, then there's some... So two in the major and then the clean. Opus 111 is the only one in the minor key. Uh, Schubert mirrors this concept, so only the first one is in the minor. And then comes the one I played the day before yesterday, maybe some of you were here. This is like a credo. You can hear the credo. It could be out of a mass. And finally, our beloved B flat sonata. Yes, we will come back to that in a moment. Uh, may I ask you how many of you? know this sonata or have heard it? Hands up. Whew. Quite a lot. How many of you have played it? <laughs> oh, thank you. So now, can we please, um, let's do a little singing, do you mind? <laughs> um, so let's sing a B, a B flat major scale. This is the B flat. So just with la, very slowly, piano, and... And now let's descend. And uh, very good. Very, very musical audience. Thank you very much. <laughs> really. um, now, please. Sing for me now in a in a cappella the the opening of this sonata. Just just the soprano line. So it starts like this. Yes? So one, two, three. <laughs> Excellent, but this is what I wanted to arrive at. <laughs> because you all know the sonata intimately, but there are details. <laughs> so, it was beautifully performed, there's nothing wrong with it, but this is polyphonic music and there are voices. You know, so when I play this... Uh, so, the, 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 the theme finishes on the B-flat. And uh, that's another voice. Am I making it clear? So please, when, whenever you hear this, uh, you are innocent, but really a lot of, 99% of pianists play it like this. Yeah, and so that's how one, one has it in one's ear. But it's completely wrong. Then it goes on. Uh, so, 
please forgive me for intruding, but this is very important. Now, Schubert writes for the first movement. I'm going to talk mostly about the first movement and touch on the others because the first is uh, the biggest and the grandest and the most important. M molto moderato is Schubert's instruction. So very measured, very moderate. He doesn't mention speed. It's not allegro, it's not andante, it's not adagio. Uh, certainly doesn't mention slowness, just very moderate and it, uh, um, it has become a habit these days to try to break the world record of slowness <laughs> in this sonata. And the slower, the better, and we, because we have to show how profound we are. <laughs> but there, nothing indicates slowness, extreme slowness in this music. And if you are familiar with the keyboard instruments from Schubert's time, uh, those are wonderful musical instruments, and they always give you the right indication for the tempo. Because on a Schubert piano, you just, you just cannot play this slowly. Because the notes will die. So, so somehow, my experience with, with old instruments have, has been invaluable because it, it really changed my life and gave me the right idea of the tempi. So, not terribly slow and also in the fast movements, <laughs> we should also have our speed limits. <laughs> now, how do we decide the character of this movement. To me, with Schubert, always the songs, the leader suggest the right ideas. Uh, he was the greatest leader composer. We all agree on that, I hope. And uh, the leader are omnipresent. They are everywhere. Uh, Let's take this song. This is called a mer at the sea. It's a wonderful poem by Heinrich Heine. And so, das Meer erglänzte weit hinaus im Abendsonnenscheine. So, the, the wide horizon of the sea at sunset. And we were sitting together lonely in a little fisherman's cottage. So, to me, this gives the perfect depiction of, of this opening of the sonata, because we have this perspective of far away, far away, and the magic of the Schubert song, I and mean, the poem is wonderful by itself, but Heine has seen the ocean, and Schubert has never been outside of Austria. So how could he give this wonderful... Yeah. 
And also, those of you who know Austria well, uh, when we used to go to Hohenems, to the Schubertiade, and later in Feldkirch, and in these small Austrian towns, I saw that in, in their inns and taverns, there were still corner tables where the men of the town or of the village would get together Friday evening or Tuesday evening and just to sing. It's called a, like a leader tafel. So this is like a, a choir sing. And also I can imagine a choir singing this. Not anymore. Yeah. So, another musical inspiration is like always with Schubert, it comes from Beethoven. Yeah. But this is much more sunny. This is one of Beethoven's more, most harmonious, sunniest pieces. And as you can hear, this doesn't start with an upbeat, but with a downbeat. And Schubert starts with an upbeat. The tempo is almost identical. I just realized that now. Uh, now, let's continue because now comes something very special, very particular. is that <laughs> so this is really very strange I of course it's a thrill but what kind of a thrill uh, this is the the strangest thrill in the history of music uh, thrill is a very old invention let me just show you a few types of thrills uh, starting with my favorite composer Johann Sebastian Bach. Here is a prelude from the 48. Yeah. Um, why does Bach write a trill here? Because on all the keyboard instruments of his time, but including the modern piano. If you play a long note, diminuendo, 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 and it's dead. End of the story. So he wants to give us the illusion of a long note and to prolong that note, and there, that's the function of the trill here, so it's alive. Yes. Um, here is another example from Joseph Haydn, his F minor variations.
uh, again, he wants to prolong the nodes, but here we have a, a chain of trills. Uh, Beethoven is again the composer who changed uh, the meaning of the trill in his final sonatas. Uh, when in Opus 111, It's almost a sacrilege to take, take out <laughs> this passage of the sonata, but I would call Beethoven's trills not, not anymore decorative, not at all, but, but existential. The, the trill as, as a mean of expression and the, the most profound expression. But this still doesn't prepare us for this. Uh, um, this is called the Nachschlag. So he has... Uh, it, yeah. uh, it's no coincidence that I played for you the song Amer, because this is nature. Uh, Schubert brings music out of the living room into nature. So I can see the, the ocean, or hear the ocean murmuring, but it's far away. And it's very, very menacing, this trill. Very dangerous. It's not friendly at all. And it comes many, many times. <laughs> We also have to talk in general about the speed of a trill. Uh, many performers, when they see the sign TR, trill, then it's, they always play the trill very fast. Uh, now in the age of iPhones, we don't have the old telephones anymore, but it's exactly how the old telephones used to sound. The how people play these trills. And it's, the trill has to express the, the character of the piece that, that it is in. Uh, so a trill can be manifold. Uh, some wonderful great artists like Wilhelm Kempf is a very good example. He, he really has a huge variety of trills. That should be our goal. Now, after this trill, there is what we call a fermata. In some languages, this is very good for our times, it's called the corona. <laughs> because the sign, it's like a semicircle and the dot under the semicircle. So it it's like, looks like a crown. But a fermata in, it, it, in Italian, it, it just means a stop. So th the music comes to a standstill. And this first movement of Schubert has more fermatas than any sonata movement that I know. The Hammerklavier of Beethoven comes very close, but Schubert's B-flat sonata has even more fermatas. Now, how long is a fermata? Do you know? Well, I don't know either, but luckily, this is one of our uh, liberties as, as performers, because uh, the composer says that the music came to a standstill. You can hold this a little shorter or a little longer, and then the music continues a tempo. But we, we can vary the length of the fermata, and that is a wonderful liberty. Now let me continue after the fermata.
what's also wonderful with Schubert, that he varies the length of his phrases. Uh, some phrases are four bars long, others are uh, six, and then he has fives and sevens and ninths, and uh, so it's never predictable and never four square. So now we go on. Mm. Now this second trill is not written out in many editions, and that's to me one of the explanations why, for example, Sviatoslav Richter, who's a very, very great artist whom I respect enormously, but he plays this movement extremely slowly because he's very faithful to the text, but he had the wrong edition. <laughs> and this, this trill was written out in hemi-demi-semi-quavers, so he counts them out of and he chooses a tempo in which you can articulate these hemi-demi-semi-quavers. But Schubert only wrote a, a, a tremolo sign. Um, luckily, I had the good fortune to, to have seen the manuscript of the last three sonatas. They are in a private collection in Basel. So I had to put on my white gloves, but then I could sit in a room with these wonderful sonatas. And I made many discoveries, small ones, not, nothing major, but this one was very important. So this is not a measured trill, but a free trill. see this very often in this sonata in, and with Schubert in general this mm -hmm. from B flat to G flat so these are so called third related keys third related tonalities it can go uh, downwards or upwards yeah and it's all over this sonata. So now let's continue. Mm -hmm. This is all pianissimo. There is no crescendo on the horizon. And now comes the first crescendo. Mm -hmm. And the first time we hear triplets. Um, this is a good time to talk about rhythm in general. Uh, Schubert's sonata structure is quite loose compared to Beethoven's. Uh, as an interpreter, it's very difficult to ruin a Beethoven sonata. You can play it very badly, but it's still there as a structure. But you can do much more damage to Schubert because the structure is very loose. And to keep it together, we have rhythm. And in each Schubert movement, in spite of the fermatas, we will have the, the, the relevant rhythmic patterns. So we, ha we have had crotchets. We have in the accompaniment quavers. And now we have triplets. This is a chromatic modulation. Mm -hmm. 
And here, the music becomes very symphonic, very orchestral. Uh, some of these Schubert sonatas are occasionally is symphonic, and then immediately, a few moments later, very intimate and very chamber music-like, again, coming back to the songs. But here, we hear the whole orchestra, and those of you who know the, the great C major symphony, or the E flat major mass, what a wonderful composition that is, and here I hear the, the horns and the, the trombones. The trombones are very important in church music, and Mozart already uses trombones in, in, in the Requiem, and, and so here this is very brassy. You know. <laughs> we expect, but it's not what we get. <laughs> yes. We are in F sharp minor, very far from F sharp minor is just a half step above the dominant, which is um, The dominant will be our goal, because usually in a classical sonata, the exposition ends on the dominant, which will be F major. And this, we will reach that, but it's a very, very long excursion. Schubert, der Wanderer. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, we have a six-bar phrase, which is very un unusual. Um, the main voice is in the tenor voice. And not the top voice. I mean, as listeners, we usually tend to listen to the top. Also in architecture, we always look to the, to the tower, to the, to the cupola. But very often in architecture and also in music, the foundation is just as important or more important. So to me, this is the main voice and this is the... can admire Schubert, the, this leader composer who, who writes for voice and piano. And this is like a song without words, but the accompaniment is so beautiful. which is parallel, again, parallel of F-sharp minor, and the... So, he's looking for, for the way out, to find the way to the dominant, F major. Not found. Variation. Yeah. And in the meantime, we 
we had for the first time the semiquavers. That's a new rhythmic pattern. Of course, they represent each four notes represent the harmony. getting closer because he mm, yeah. here on the piano we have many of you know this that enharmonic notes so A sharp and B flat are the, the same key on the piano but when we listen to music we don't think of it as the same key so we are going to the towards B minor. And with B flat, we are going towards D minor, which is already the parallel tonality of F major, which is our goal. Then we have a little bit of light. This is B flat major, this is our tonic, but we don't feel this is the tonic anymore. <laughs> now, this is already F major. 6 4 chord. Mm -hmm. And now we have reached our goal because this will be the, the final theme. There will be a final, final theme, but this is very important again. Uh, there are triplets in the soprano. And that's what we hear. But much more important is this. Mm. Mm. This will be one of the main motives of the development section. So this is a, a slow dactyl. Long, short, short, long, short, short, and so to the, together. Mm. Yeah. Then inverted counterpoint. Now the right hand plays the dactyl and the left hand plays the triplets. Six bars, now correction. This is not a fermata, but somehow he changes the meter because you suddenly hear one, two, three, one, two, three. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, and back to four. And at last we have a, an F major tonic chord. Now comes Another idea. Fermata. Um, so there are plenty of outbreaks in this sonata. You will you will hear it, um, but they are the exception to the rule. It's the calmness and the 
tranquility that dominate. But this is a very tempestuous passage. Uh. <laughs> Fermata. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. Now I come to the crucial question. To repeat or not to repeat? That is the question. Uh, there are different opinions. Yes. My wonderful friend and colleague, Al Alfred Brendel, who is a great, great Schubert interpreter, and of this sonata, he's absolutely convinced that this should not be repeated. I am absolutely convinced it has to be repeated. <laughs> because, well, I, I love it so much, and there are more important reasons than love <laughs> in this case. Uh, why? Let me play you this prima volta, this first ending. Mm -hmm. So, motivically, this tr the pianissimo trill So he plays with this motif, yes, and at the end of this section, we ha we have like a gigantic earthquake, that an apocalyptic trill, the one and only time. And Schubert took all the trouble to write this first ending. So, um, who am I to question Schubert? I mean, he's really, he, he wrote this and with, with the utmost uh, conviction. Uh, so, and also proportionally. So, if you repeat the exposition and set it against the development and the recapitulation and the coda, then, then, then you have a perfect structure. Um, if, if the exposition is only heard once, then it's a lopsided structure. So, uh, to me, anyway, I'm not dogmatic about repeats. There are certain repeats in, second repeats in certain Haydn and Mozart pieces uh, which I would maybe consider not doing, but even there, I have a very bad conscience. <laughs> mm. So let's let's trust the composer; he knows best. So I'm not going to play. Uh, when you will hear the sonata, you will have to sit through the repeat. <laughs> but uh, here. We go into the development section. And this is a wonderful move moment. Um, yes. Uh, so he moves again in a third related key of C sharp minor. And this is very important because this, the slow movement will be in this key. And that is no coincidence. So he, he gives us a first taste of this C sharp minor. Then how different our main themes sounds in C sharp minor. Mm. 
F-sharp minor. This is beautiful, this Napolitan. Again. Yes, and the deceptive cadence. Uh, now again we hear this motif. The ductile. Try to concentrate always on the ductile. Me too. So. so after six bars, he modulates just a half step down G sharp minor. three bars, so again we have very irregular phrase lengths. Now B major, mm. and then B flat minor, so mm. so mm. After about 30 bars, here we are again, uh, D flat and harmonic with C sharp. And so it has been a verloren a mu, lost labor, love labors lost. So he made a huge excursion and made a circle and didn't arrive anywhere. <laughs> so he has to try again finding the way to the recapitulation. <laughs> so, quavers yeah. and ductiles. Dissonance, it is, it is really terribly painful. Yeah, so. We had this in the exposition. Uh, now comes the Winterreise spot. This one. It's just my imagination, but I'm not, I'm not, not far 
of of the sermon. the B flat in the home key but again we, we don't feel like homecoming and here Schubert writes P P P triple pianissimo this is almost not possible on a modern piano but luckily this piano we lovingly call this piano the old lady and it's the old piano of the Wigmore Hall and Ulrich Gerhardt, my friend, he prepared this very beautifully. So even, a, even on a Steinway piano, a triple piano is possible. But again, my ideal here is the old forte piano, where there is a moderator that puts a, f a layer of silk between the hammers and the strings and it produces an, an ethereal, beautiful, very, very soft sound. And, and this is what Schubert also had in his ears. So, something like that. Back to D minor, Winterreise. So he's playing with this, is this going to be major or minor? No, so quavers then triplets and the trill. This moment of recapitulation in sonata form, in classical sonatas, is one of the best inventions of humankind, <laughs> if I may say so. And this moment of the, the homecoming, this, this, this aha, at last. I, I'm, I'm afraid, but with newer music, we lost this. I, I just don't feel this anymore. I feel other emotions and other sensations, but we people, we like to come home. Uh, yes, I'm wherever home is, even when we are refugees <laughs> or guests, but uh, a home is a home. And this is this feeling of after such a long excursion, this development section. So, I think I said enough of the first movement. Uh, let me just play the coda and go into the second movement. to follow exactly uh, the length of, of these final bars. It's not ad libitum, it's five beats. Now, as 
I said before. Mm, no. C sharp minor, the famous second movement. Andante, which means in Italian walking, at a walking space. Andante doesn't mean slow. It's a misconception. Uh, but, however, andante sostenuto. So sustained, so sostenuto describes the character of, of the music. So at, at a walking pace and sustained. Um, this is one of these wonderful movements which have a monotonous ostinato. Yes. So I imagine this like a, a kind of a barcarolle, somebody sitting in, in a boat. It, it's, it has to be night, this is not daytime. And uh, one solitary figure just rowing and rowing and rowing. So now, above that, we have two singers. <laughs> If it weren't in thirds, it could be a, a Bach Sarabande. There's something in the, in the Sarabande, the first and the second beat, it's, it's a three, four uh, meter, and the first and the second beats are uh, accented. It's not similarly, and the third one is not, so... Usually Schubert writes at the beginning con pedale. So he wants pedal, sustaining pedal to be used, but how much it's up to us. <laughs> Less is more. Then here more voices enter. we had here five. Again, he, he changes the length all the time. So now, this is the fifth bar. And now, only four bars. Uh, again, for us performers, the, the rhythm is sacred here. Uh, one has to be very free, but this ostinato, this monotonous um, pulse, it has to, has to go through the whole movement. And to me, it always helps in all Schubert to find the, the dominant rhythm in each movement. And so we can hold it together. Let's continue.
So when you play this, this has to be very long. Yeah? So again, the Schubert forte piano gives you the idea because if, if this is played slower than this, then the long note will disappear and that will be a terrible pity. So mm, So, Bar Carol, again, Schubert has never been to Venice, poor man. But uh, this is a, a gondoliera, so, so a Bar Carol. And this movement is not symphonic at all. But now comes the middle part, which is, again, third related mm -hmm. and to me this middle section is et incarnatus est again it's just a metaphor but I can sing it to et incarnatus est yeah? and again we have the the rhythm and then you can hear the trombones, brass instruments again, like like in a requiem. He repeats this section in a, in a variation uh, out of a lead, out of a song. This is like... A Schubert could write such wonderful accompanying figures. So, so it's, it's very beautiful how the, the trombones of the Requiem are transformed in, into a very intimate lead. So now the second part of this, trombones. favorite part of this is when is when, when he goes into B flat now yes so, suddenly the music takes a, a turn and we 
we get into a completely different landscape. So then also this, this section gets repeated in a, in a song-like manner. And uh, <laughs> suddenly the, the music freezes. It's a very, very, very scary moment. And then the A section returns uh, varied with a, with a different ostinato. These short semiquavers a fate motif. Uh, here we have now Instead of semiquaver, instead of semiquavers, we have, we have uh, hemi, uh, demi semiquavers, yes, but only a few times. Mm -hmm. So when Schubert says "con pedale," but please not here. Uh, the pedal would ruin the faith, faith motif. This has to be like death knocking on the door. Um, there is another fantastic move moment here. <laughs> in the bass, but chromatically colored in the soprano line. Um, the, so it ends very quietly with triple pianissimo. Uh, we go into the tonic major. ends in major, but as of almost always with Schubert, the, the major is much more terrible <laughs> than the minor, because the minor is obvious. I mean, we all feel that this is not, not a jolly piece of music. But here comes death as a, f as a savior, as, as a friend. He is not afraid of that. I mean, Schubert knew already seven or eight years ago that he was mortally ill with syphilis. So he was waiting for this moment every day of his life and is welcoming uh, death. <laughs> He adds this this very dissonant ninth chord.
if this was the unfinished symphony, he could finish the sonata here. <laughs> because to me, this is complete. That has arrived. So what happens after that? And here, the, the composition becomes a little bit problematic, certainly in the last movement, which maybe you can help me to, to solve this puzzle or riddle, because I don't feel it with all my love to Schubert and also to this last movement, but I just don't see how this last movement belongs to this sonata. In the other two of the final sonatas, this is, this is obvious. Uh, but maybe we find a solution together. Anyway, the, the scherzo has a justification because it's, it's music after death. Uh, maybe the soul is partly here, and it's somebody who, who, who has died but is still hallucinating. And this is the kind of music that maybe one hears when one hallucinates. Scherzo. So, scherzo is a joke, actually, but this is not funny. Spianissimo, uh, it says vivace, so very lively, and con delicatezza, very delicately. Uh, to imagine again a perspective that the music is not here but but far away out of our reach mm. yeah goes to the subdominant Subdominant of the subdominant. Uh, the song composer is always there. Uh, and now comes the dancer. Schubert was a, a lousy dancer. <laughs> I am too. But he played, according to witnesses, wonderful dance music at, at balls and so. He, he entertained his friends who were wonderful dancers. Vienna is still a, a great city for, for balls and dances. And uh, so here is one of those. <laughs> Six. Five, six, five, six, five, five. So you see again, sixes and sixes and then fives. Um, this is quintessentially Viennese music. I'm sorry to say because I'm not a nationalist in any field, but Schubert is not a German composer. <laughs> uh, it, he, he speaks with a dialect. Uh, of course he's for the whole world to, to enjoy and to admire, but thi this kind of music... Uh, <laughs> And 
Then there is a trio section, the middle section, uh, which is quite bizarre. Uh, if I would play this, and if I play it uh, harmonized. Uh, something like like a mazurka but what does Schubert do here he disturbs this mazurka he dis destroys it with the accents the syncopated accents of the left hand Last one he marks F F Z for Sforzatissimo. And then the scherzo returns. Yes. He adds these three tonic chords and goes immediately attacca in his finale, um, which is a wonderful piece. But I just don't see how it belongs to this sonata. I will play it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I can see this was hallucination, but what is this one then? First of all, this movement starts in the wrong key. <laughs> because this, this G, which is marked forte piano, so you have to play it in a bell-like manner, so pam, pam. Very difficult on the piano, but I have a good trick for it. But yeah, so you hold it with the pedal and you play it again mute and then let the pedal go. It's not so bad. But so there is always with Schubert a, a Beethovenian model. Uh, funnily enough, it's, he usually uh, he never copies Beethoven, but he refers to him as a as a homage, as a homage. And um, it's usually earlier and middle period Beethoven pieces, because we don't have any evidence that Schubert actually knew the late quartets. But here is an example. So this is the finale of Beethoven's string quartet opus 130, which was or originally uh, the, the Grosse Fuge, but he wrote, people found the Grosse Fuge very problematic, and so Beethoven wrote a, a finale that, that, that was easier to comprehend. And it also starts on the wrong key, so dominant of, of C minor, and then a dominant of B flat. And it's exactly the same pattern. This cannot be a coincidence. Uh, now, the theme itself is again. Uh, Arthur Schnabel, one of my heroes, he invented the words 
for this movement. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich weine, ich weiß nicht, ob ich lache. I don't know whether I cry, I don't know whether I laugh. And that's beautiful. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich weine, ich weiß nicht, Again, very Viennese. In, in Vienna, we call this a, a Gassenhauer, a, a street song. But how does this come after those three movements? Hmm? Maybe somebody knows the answer. I would be very interested. Anyway, uh, let's continue. An octave higher. If you go to Vienna, you still see horse carts, yes, in uh, little carriages pulled by horses, and they uh, they boom. I can hear the, I can even smell the horses here. <laughs> getting uh, a little angry, but not furious. Uh, here you the variation. This is beautiful this modulation into A flat. So we are still not going anywhere. The, this movement is in sonata rondo form, yes? with the de development section. So, um, now... Um, Beethoven. Yes, and now we are going to approach the dominant. the dominant of the dominant, so the Wechsel Dominante. Yeah, so this is where we are going. Now we have a beautiful second theme here. Uh, I play this now as a choral. This is the a beautiful example of how wonderfully Schubert writes for the piano, because he adds an ac accompanying figure. And the bass comes uh, always a quaver late, like a cello pizzicato. Tenor voice here. Now listen 
to this. Yes, all plagal uh, steps. Back to F major. important for performers to know the difference between diminuendo and decrescendo. It's, they seem to be identical, uh, and they are with some composers. However, Schubert uses both, and if you know enough pieces by Schubert, it's obvious that when he writes decrescendo, he means get softer, but stay in tempo. When he writes diminuendo, get softer and also uh, retard a little bit, not a lot. If he wants a big retardando, he will write out retardando. Uh, for example, where I just stopped, it's only decrescendo, so I'm not, not allowed to slow down. This is the only eruption and the parallel place. But again, this is pure Beethoven, because look at this passage. Yeah, so F minor and the Napolitan, yeah? So it's even the same, same tonality as the Appassionata. Uh, however, after this eruption, Schubert comes back to himself. Mm. Mm. And then we hear our Gassen Hauer in a different uh, variation. The upbeat becomes a semiquaver. Uh, now let's just touch the development section. from this and then a kind of an inversion of of our theme yesterday about this fact that of all the great composers after Bach, I find that Schubert is maybe the exception to the rule, who doesn't have a lot to do with Bach. Uh, but here, we, towards the end of his life, he, he was beginning to take counterpoint lessons. And uh, we can feel, feel it here. I still believe firmly that 
we don't love Schubert because of his fugues. <laughs> I think the Wanderer Fantasy is a fantastic masterpiece, but... but so here, here. I mean, this is a ridiculous fugue. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he, after four entries, Schubert seems to say, to hell with this fugue. <laughs> and he comes back to the fantasy. Uh, but here we have wonderful counterpoint. passage justifies the presence of this movement as finale, because this is the climax, this C flat. So maybe we can derive this from the trill. Yes, and the... Yeah, so... back to the recapitulation. I think I used your patience more than enough. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, take a good break and enjoy the interval and if you still can bear with me then please come back and listen to the whole sonata. Thank you very much.